Rebecca Hall, who um, just launched a National Lawyers Guild chapter in Utah. Um, it's going to be doing, yeah, right? This is great. It's going to be doing a two hour long legal uh, briefing and legal observer training for those of you guys who would like to take on the roles like Jill did in, in this mock scenario. Um, so just mark the calendars May 12th. It's a Saturday, and I think she decided 11 to 1. Where? Um, at the warehouse. 1361 South Main. Um, so, good segue into if you don't have your email, if you're not on one of our email lists, before you leave today, make sure you give it to us so that we can keep you uh, knowledgeable about our next events and trainings and allies events. Um, so, here we go. No, you're right. Um, I think this is something that obviously this role play was quick didn't have enough time to plan it. Uh, I'm not a cop, Rachel's not a cop, Ryan's not a cop, so some of what we did may not have been the most realistic cop thing. What we were really trying to do is get people to feel what it feels like to be in an escalatory situation and dealing with emotions and triggers, etc. Um, but, so, and also not, we're not saying that cops are bad people that all escalate like that. Um, we've actually had a lot of interactions, especially in Salt Lake City, where things went really, really smoothly with the police liaison. So we should keep that in mind. Um, and I'm not a lawyer either, as it turns out. So, um, no, you're right. Um, one thing that I think is pretty cool is to look at the origins of our rights, looking specifically at uh, four amendments. The First Amendment actually gives you the right to associate for change. Your Second Amendment, I'm sorry, the Fourth Amendment gives you the right to be free from any unreasonable searches and seizures. Your Fifth Amendment gives you the right to remain silent. And the Sixth Amendment gives you a right to an attorney. So just for some historical context and background. And I'm also gonna ask, leave questions to the end. Possibly I will not be able to answer them but it's good to ask them just in case other people have the same question um, <coughs> for, further, for further experiences. So general protocol, um, and this is again from one of uh, Rebecca's trainings, but keep your hands visible um, when you're interacting with authority. Make sure you move slowly. Do not touch an officer or any of their stuff. That means like their baton, their car, uh, their dog, if they have one, unless just don't, that's a kind of as a, as a general rule of thumb, you touching an officer's property is like you touching the officer. Um, and then also be polite as often as you can. There's no, I think a point that Ryan brought up at the beginning, in our protest, unless you're protesting specifically against that your target is the police, which I just haven't seen, um, those are the targets. So we're not trying to get something from that particular police officer on that day. We're trying to get something from that particular legislator and whatnot. So I think it's uh, it's important to remember that. And then there are three types of police encounters. There's a conversation with a police officer. There's detention, and then there's arrest. So it's good to know which one of these you're currently in when talking to an officer. Then, so if we're talking about a conversation, you actually don't have to engage in conversation. Um, I think this brings it back to, and I forgive me if Ryan mentioned this, but this brings it back to what agreements you make as a community or as a group before taking action. So the agreement of only Ethan and Sarah are going to be speaking to the police because they're the police liaison. The agreement to we're not going to resist arrest. We're going to get arrested with our heads up high and whatnot. That's a decision that you make as a group and things that people should talk through. And again, um, if you're ever in that situation, you should speak to uh, legal counsel that knows the particular jurisdiction and the particular laws of that space. Um, so, if you do not want to engage in conversation, you can actually ask, am I free to leave? Can I go? If they say yes, 
then you should leave. If they say no, then you should follow up with, am I being detained? And if they say, no, you're not being detained, then you can go. However, if they say, yes, you're being detained, because they, they feel that they've been triggered by reasonable suspicion that you've been involved in any kind of unlawful activity, um, you know that you're not free to leave, but you're not under arrest. Right? So those are the different levels. There's detention and then there's arrest. So ask if you're being detained. If yes, stick around, but know that you're still not under arrest. So under detention, you still have rights. It's supposed to be a short period of time. If it's a long period of time, then you're actually being arrested. Um, they're not supposed to move you. If you're being moved, again, that means you're being, if you're being moved from a place that you're protesting to any kind of holding space, then that means you're being, then that implies that you're being arrested. So technically, they shouldn't move really you. Um, they can pat you down for weapons, but you do not have to open up your belongings. They, you do not, they do not have that right automatically to search your belongings, which is the same thing if you're at home. They don't necessarily have a right to come into your home to search your house. Um, you use the phrase, I do not consent to a search. Right? Yeah, and we'll look at the totally. I do not consent to a search is one of your magic words. Um, what you are required to give is your name, your address, and your date of birth, if asked. Um, there are some people that have chosen to not give those things. That just makes your time with the police longer. That's your personal choice. That's probably a communal choice if people are, are choosing to, to, risk, or to risk arrest. But again, you not giving your name, your date of birth, or your address will just mean that they're going to keep holding you until you do or until they find out who you are. So that's a personal decision you have to make. No other information is actually required. Um, you choose the level of information that you give to police. You choose the level of information that you give to media. And that, again, should be a communal agreement. Um, because I don't think there's ever black and white, right and wrong. Um, again, so you still uh, just oh, yeah, being detained, yeah. but if you ask for further information, uh, you can ask am I free to leave again. But you should always remember to ask am I free to leave. But if you've been told no, you're not, you probably stop saying that. So you should leave. Um, if yes, politely, politely leave and say nothing. If no, ask why. Right? You really have a right to know why you're being detained. Um, and then your magic words are, one, I'm going to remain silent, two, I want a lawyer, or three, I do not consent to this or any search. So we said that there were three levels of interaction and the third one being arrest, and that can look very differently in a lot of different situations. Um, and if you are ever considering taking action where you are risking arrest, I will just say my advice to you is speak to a lawyer before you do and know the consequences so that you're not just jumping into something and you don't recognize the consequences. One thing I will say from the role play is um, Jill was sitting, who was the other legal observer but Jill? Who was the only one? Um, Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, Jill. <coughs> so I don't know if you noticed, and I know we, you didn't get to fully play on this out and flush it out, but if people are, are risking arrest and putting themselves in that situation, you should probably have a phone number to call, and that's what we refer to as the rules for jail support. A phone number for you to call once you're in jail and you get that one phone call. Uh, usually, maybe that one phone call, even though you want it to be to uh, your partner or your mother or your cousin that you're really close to, unless that person has a plan for and knows about that, you should probably call the jail support number, which is planned out and flushed out before you take action. The thing you really want is you want your legal observers to be present in case there's anything that happens that you should that is un, that's happening that's unjust. But also you want them to to have your phone number and I'm, I'm sorry, you want them to have your name and somebody for them to call to tell them that you're in prison or that you're in jail. Not prison.
Because if you're supposed to be home at 6 o'clock, and that night you don't come home at 6 o'clock, and somebody is expecting you home at 6 o'clock, and you can't call them because you called somebody else from jail, that that's what the jail support team is for. They'll make sure that that person gets called, whatever number you gave them, and knows that you're okay. So, that's all I'm comfortable giving in terms of a very brief legal briefing. I do want to open it up for questions or anything that you'd like to share. And also keep in mind that this is kind of a basic, and I actually like that, that this is a very basic thing and it's always an individual responsibility and an individual choice. We're not